Well, good evening, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, Fire is uh, very much a product of its setting, and as that setting uh, changes, fire changes, and our understanding of it has to change as well. So this evening, I'd like to uh, scroll through uh, a different way, perhaps, of, of examining the history. A lot of it will seem familiar to many of you, but I think the larger frame, once we get into it, uh, may be novel and may allow us some different insights. So with that, um, too long introduction, let me let me get into the uh, show itself. Between three fires, I'm going to look at the American setting, uh, but the global context will be important as well. There we go. I like to begin with um, this map. This was produced by the 1880 census, incredibly enough. It's a map of forest fires. Uh, the darker the area, the higher percentage of land burned. It doesn't include uh, the grasslands. Um, it doesn't, let me go back. It doesn't include the grasslands, uh, uh, desert sage, uh, and so forth. Uh, in some places just didn't have enough people to record it. But that's what the geography uh, looked like at the time. In many ways, the US was much like Brazil in recent years. A lot of, a lot of fires from land clearing, um, a lot of uh, fires from agriculture, and a certain amount from uh, industrialization. There are actually three fires. One way to think about this is, that, is uh, an overlay of three fires. One is the fire from nature, uh, been around for 400 million years plus. Um, creating what we might call first nature. And that's what the geography of ignitions, uh, forest fire ignitions, or at least landscape fire ignitions looks like. It doesn't account for burned area, just ignitions. Very different map than what we see in the background. And the reason is because people were using fire um, for hunting, gathering, uh, farming, um, just ease of travel, uh, protection against wild fires, uh, scores, of, scores of reasons, each peculiar to uh, time and place. But together uh, around the world, people made a kind of second nature. That's an old concept uh, that people had taken uh, what raw nature presented and through their artifice and imagination created a second nature. And in this case, the use of fire in what we might call living landscapes uh, was the means to do that. And that accounts for most of what we see in that background. At the same time, there's a third fire coming into play, uh, crossing the continent, it's in this Courier and Ives print, of a train, um, most likely burning coal. We're beginning, we found a new uh, source of combustibles um, buried in geologic time. We dug it out, we're burning it and releasing its consequences into the future. And that is uh, the deepest driver right now of the world we live in and fire. We'll come back to that image. Living landscapes, as I said, fire has been a component as long as there have been plants, but it always comes with checks and balances. That's what uh, fire ecology is all about. When we go into the geologic past, or what I think of as lithic landscapes, once living, now fossilized landscapes, um, all those old checks and balances are gone. Uh, in fact, we're dealing not with sources. The, the quest for fire for humanity had always been finding new things to burn and new ways to burn it. Now the problem is where to put all the stuff that's left over from the burning. And in this case, all the old checks and balances are gone. You can burn winter and summer, um, drought or deluge, day or night, it doesn't matter. Uh, and that means it exists outside of and in a way over, overloads uh, the capacity of the existing world to accommodate it. And we'll see what some of those consequences are. But we've used this transition, what I think was the pyric transition a phrase I coined many years ago and is completely misused and misunderstood, but I'm going to try once more. But we've used that to rework, replace all of the working fires that had filled our lives, all the domestic fires from candles and hearths, all now replaced, even made virtual. 
modern cities, old cities used to be made of reconstituted living landscapes for the most part. They were reconstituted for us now, and they burned like that. Now we've remade it. Uh, in a sense, all these materials have been burned previously to make glass, steel, concrete. Um, and they're pretty incombustible. We design them as such. So fire is removed. Even at my university, students were prohibited from having candles in their room. Open flame is not allowed. And we extend that same process into agriculture. So much of it, which outside of um, floodplains, uh, was dependent on fire or a kind of fire fallow cycle. Now, the whole green revolution is premised on fossil fuels, petrochemicals uh, derived from it, um, machines to deliver it or to, to create uh, the water that's needed. Uh, fallowing has gone. The fallow is now made into productive acres, but the fallow was where most of the biodiversity in the old systems resided. So that's been gone. And what about wildlands? Well, the way we used to handle fire in wildlands was to substitute our own fire for it uh, or to modify the landscape in ways. Or if we were faced with a large fire, here's a, a great uh, watercolor uh, from the 1860s, uh, setting, setting backfires and uh, burning out around the encampment. But now uh, we've gone to uh, a counter fire from industrial combustion. In effect, when you add up all of this pirate transition, we're creating and living in increasingly a third nature uh, made with what was a, an enormous fossil fallow that's now been brought into production and which is slopping over any kind of boundaries. So let me spend uh, a little time on this. Uh, the impact of industrial um, transport and consumption was uh, a large array of wrecked landscapes around the world. Uh, the ax and fire would follow um, the train. The train would be responsible for many fires. And we have a whole series of uh, ruined, uh, wrecked, or uh, uh, landscapes, or even uh, communities, whole communities uh, consumed. We had a wave of mega fires uh, from about 1870 uh, to 1920, as larger in many cases, much larger and more lethal than what we've seen in recent years. It was not driven by climate, we're at the end of the Little Ice Age. It was driven by enormous amounts of land clearing slash and logging slash. And that was the background to state sponsored conservation. The state would have to intervene. Uh, the assignment was somewhat by default fell to foresters. Here's our first professional forester, Bernard Ferno from Prussia, uh, dismissed the whole scene as one of the bad habits and loose morals. Uh, here's Gifford Pinchot, then head of the Bureau of Forestry, later first chief uh, forester for the U.S. Uh, Forest Service uh, in 1898, arguing that fire protection is is equivalent uh, to the is is analogous, not equivalent to, but analogous to the question of slavery that may be shelved for a while, but uh, an enormous cost in the end must sooner or later must be met. Wow. Um, Talk about a uh, hostile view towards fire. Uh, the early Forest Service on average had one fire guard for every 670 square miles it administered. You wonder what, what, what were they possibly thinking of? But they thought that if they could control people, they could control fires uh, because people were so extensive uh, in, and so responsible for fuels and ignition. So a series of uh, legislative acts uh, and administrative moves, creates forest reserves, uh, and then transfers them in 1905. This was a global project. It was done by all of the European uh, colonizers. Uh, here, uh, here on the left, the, uh, in the Rocky Mountains, on the right in the central provinces of India, here's our hilltop forester with his lookout post 
looking for what were called jungle fires. And then he would uh, uh, beat on the drum in the foreground and that would rally the villagers to help put it out. The problem was that the villagers were typically the ones responsible for setting it and had no interest in putting it out. Uh, and if any of you are uh, a fan of Kipling, you may wonder what happens to Mowgli after he grows up. Well, Kipling wrote a, a short story sequel and it turns out Mowgli joins the Indian Forest Service and becomes a fire guard. And I love the story because it shows the range of interest uh, among the literate classes in fire and the sense in which fire was damaging. And there are plenty of examples where it was. Uh, the U.S. story hinges in many ways. We have an interesting creation or origin story, if you will, with the big blow up of 1910. Uh, most of you are, I'm sure, familiar with it. Uh, heaviest concentration was about three and a quarter million acres in the northern Rockies. The smoke was actually tracked. The geographers were at work and it went all the way to the east and they identified the different character of smoke uh, as it progressed. And of course, the story of Ed Pulaski and others either killed or spared by the fires thanks to their efforts. Uh, it's an extraordinary story and in many ways a trauma for the Forest Service uh, that set it on its way. Uh, at the same time, August 1910, uh, a controversy boiled over in Northern California that became known as light burning. It argued that this whole approach that the Forest Service and others were taking modeled on Europe uh, was misguided. That what we really should be doing is doing what the Native Americans had done and routinely burn at least the montane forest, the lower elevation forests and many other areas uh, as well. This is actually the larger photo is from Northern California, it's Plumas County uh, after in the fall of 1910. Um, and the light burning controversy was a very it was a very serious challenge to the intellectual and political legitimacy of the Forest Service and indeed conservation. And here's Aldo Leopold in 1920 arguing that um, the whole Forest Service policy of preventing fires as much as possible is threatened by light burning propaganda. And I can find no effort, no evidence that he ever fully converted. He came to accept that fire might have a useful role. He was certainly in communication with people who believe that, but I can't see that he ever flipped to the point where he said, we ought to put it back in. By uh, the early 1920s, however, light burning was defeated, at least officially. In the meantime, four generations of chief foresters uh, had faced the fire, Graves as a challenge, uh, I mean, just, became chief forester in, in uh, January um, of 1910. And the next three were all personally on the fire line and were determined it would never happen again. It was a kind of Valley Forge or Long March experience for that whole generation. And then subsequently the Weeks Act sets up federal state cooperation based for forestry, but ultimately based on fire protection, which created a national infrastructure. And the Forest Service, then assumed responsibilities for that and for the next 50 years created a national model, uh, but also established a policy essentially of fire suppression and ruled as a kind of hegemon. Uh, the amount of innovation um, and attention uh, devoted around the country is really astonishing. Uh, and lots of innovations from uh, radio in uh, mountainous terrain was developed uh, for firefighting. The bulldozer is reportedly uh, invented for building fire roads and, and fire breaks. And uh, after World War I, uh, all, all those mothballed biplanes were put to use for fire reconnaissance. Still, uh, most of the population was committed to fire. That's how agriculture worked. That's how they had grown up. That's how, that's the life they knew. Um, here's uh, Chief Forester Greeley denouncing traditional burning as Paiute forestry, but it wasn't limited, limited to indigenous people. Uh, any traditional users of fire were put into the same category. 
Here we have the Dixie Crusaders a project uh, cooked up by the Forest Service and uh, American Forestry Association to spread the gospel of fire prevention. And they modeled themselves on uh, uh, revivalist tent revivalist programs, primarily in the Southeast and um, got people to swear off woods burning. Uh, unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of backsliding went on afterwards. Uh, the Forest Service was so frustrated at one point it actually hired a professional psychologist to investigate woods burning because it was so clearly irrational that there had to be some subconscious, some non-rational motivation that was propelling people uh, to do it because all of the science of the day and um, all of the educated uh, really knew in their bones that uh, this was, was wrong. Fire was primitive. Um, fire was a stigma of backwardness. Uh, a modern rational society uh, would find alternatives to fire. And we've seen how that was very effective in houses and cities. Uh, and in some ways with real mixed results in agriculture, but really colossal failures uh, in, in wildlands. Still, the agency could only project itself so far. It didn't have much access, didn't have much material. What to do about, what to do about all those remote areas, what to do about all that abandoned, cut over and burned over area that was then abandoned. What happens is the New Deal uh, and the Civilian Conservation Corps, an effort to rehabilitate society and uh, environment equally. In 1934, fires returned to the Northern Rockies. Here's Chief Forester Gus Silcox, who was the number two man in the big firefight. And uh, he gathers together, uh, after gathers together a number of advisors, they debate what to do. And what happens is 1935, uh, what was became known as the Forester's Policy or the 10 a.m. Policy, a single standard for fire. Uh, which sounds crazy even at the time, but if you have all the resources that were available, it didn't seem crazy. You had hundreds of thousands of young men uh, in camps uh, looking for things to do. Probably half of all the labor they did was either fire control or uh, pre-suppression of one kind. This gave way to our modern crews, both of which evolved out of uh, to the CCC experience. And of course, huge public works projects, the Ponderosa Way uh, and Truck Trail, uh, a 750 mile long fuel break that spanned the entire Western front of the Sierra Nevada. Uh, there was political interest at the highest level. Here's President Roosevelt himself approving a new fire prevention poster. And you'll note that the guy standing next to Uncle Sam looks an awful lot like him. And that's, he, that's James Montgomery Flagg, the artist who modeled Uncle Sam on himself, yes. And then um, the policy 10 a.m. and other fire controls goes to war. World War II was in many ways a fire war. The U.S. was even attacked by fire balloons lofted from Japan. And in retaliation, Japan got uh, the atomic bomb. The famous photo, the Hiroshima atomic strike, army uh, labeled. That is not, however, the mushroom cloud of the atomic bomb. That is the pyrocumulus cloud of the burning city. So fire uh, did enormous damage. Um, hostile fire did a lot of damage in the war, was an extremely effective weapon, but in some ways an unpredictable one. And the military becomes now takes an interest in fire. Uh, that's reinforced when a quarter of a million acres burn along coastal Maine in 1947. And then we have what I think of as Wu Wee One, uh, the 1961 fires in LA that start uh, as we convert from uh, a rural environment into an exurban one. The CCC is gone, but lots of war surplus equipment is available, a whole lot. And this is uh, converted very quickly, almost overnight, 
uh, into firefighting to make up for the lost CCC. And in a sense, we have a Cold War on fire, uh, the, the other red menace, if you will. We mobilize science, again, on the wartime example. Uh, equipment development centers are created partly to uh, help convert war surplus stuff, but also uh, to invent new stuff. And even Hollywood and popular culture join in. And we have uh, essentially war movies uh, like Red Skies of Montana, but with a fire setting. <clears throat> By 1960, 50 years after the big blow up, the Forest Service had more or less achieved what it was told to do and sought to do. It controlled virtually everything in the fire arena. It was the federal uh, connection for all of the states uh, and other agency, federal agencies. It controlled almost all resources. It set policy. Almost all research uh, was through it in one way. It ruled the prevention uh, program and it spoke with professional authority. Uh, in 1960, a famous study of the agency concluded this was as good as public administration got. 50 years later, the Forest Service will be identified as the model of dysfunctional democracy. So a lot of things are going to happen uh, coming up. But in 1960-61, the agency was pretty much riding high and seemed to have done what it set out. I mean, the, the National Park Service at this time had two dedicated fire officers for its entire um, system. Uh, the BLM was, what, 14 years old, uh, could barely uh, staff a pickup truck with tools and firefighters, if it was called. It, it had really developed the Fish and Wildlife Service, didn't exist as an agency, and so on and so forth. So it's hard to appreciate now the extent to which is, but it matters because they bequeath a national system uh, that, that will be extremely important. And that's usually the, the story we tell. Now, let me back up a little and tell the other part of the story, the pirate transition story in Wildlands. Here's a primary energy, 1850 to 2000. And I've bracketed those that deal with fire overwhelmingly fire. And let's abstract out of that period uh, the zone for which we have uh, moderately good records of, of burning, burned area. It's not conclusive, but we can see federal, state, and unprotected lands. And you can see that the whole project is moving lands from unprotected to protected status. And once you do that, the amount of burned area plummets. And that occurs during that time. Is that just a correlation? Well, let's look at this one. Here's area burned in that kind of tan. It's the same graph as, uh, above uh, composite. And then the uh, dotted line is the uh, fossil fuel emissions. And they cross. And there's a kind of sweet spot right after World War II uh, into the early 80s, maybe mid 80s. Uh, where that project seemed to have uh, succeeded. Certainly by the 60s, you can see a uh, major change. And this to me is part of what happened. Apart from policy, apart from science, apart from anything else, we could not have attempted to control these fires if we did not have a counter source, a counter force, in this case, combustion counter source, uh, to try to match it. If we took away all those planes and helicopters, all those bulldozers and grazer, graders, all those roads, all those engines, chainsaws and pumps, could we pretend to do much about fire fighting? We would have to do what people had always done. We would have to organize the landscape in a better way, and we would have to substitute our fires for wildfires. Instead, we kept at it and we went from a big blow up to what we might call the big blowback. We see the consequences. And I'd like to point out that all this happens without climate change. This is simply a result at a local scale of shifting from one kind of firepower to another, going from living to lithic landscapes. Well, in 1962, uh, we start seeing 
the first tremors of what will overthrow the old regime uh, and create what I like to think of as a fire revolution and it will result in new policies. Um, not just fight bad fires, but restore good fires and new institutions because one agency is not going to be in charge of it all. We need lots of agencies. We'll have a civil society. Uh, we will have non-governmental um, and intergovernmental uh, cooperatives. I mean, the, the American fire establishment now is huge and it's all over the place. Um, also major changes in environmental thinking that will be reflected in the public domain will go from a kind of multiple use melting pot to a special interest mosaic. And those that have those agencies or institutions that have specific goals and targets will do fairly well. Those that try to integrate everything and have to balance competing needs are going to be in a hard way. So the revolution uh, is two poles, uh, one in Florida, really centered on prescribed fire, uh, private and working landscapes, as well as public and a California model that really is interested in wildlands, natural fire, and predominantly uh, concerned with uh, public lands. In 1962, the Nature Conservancy conducts its first burn, a prairie in Minnesota, and the Tall Timbers Research Station, a privately endowed operation, begins a series of fire ecology conferences. Uh, an alternative voice to the Forest Service. And it's astonishing how quickly the old regime collapses. By 1967, 68, the National Park Service created new policies, rejecting the 10 a.m. policy in favor of fire restoration, primarily through uh, natural means, but uh, prescribed fire where, where necessary. And 10 years later, the Forest Service follows suit. So these are not new issues. The problem is not policy. The problem has been applying it. So what was the new essence? It was a sense of prescribed fire as a compromise between letting fires burn and trying to put all fires out. And we would extend that to natural fires by calling them prescribed natural fires, designating conditions and even for a wildfire, there are a range of options. You don't have to contain it by 10 o'clock the next day. Uh, you can confine it, which looks an awful lot like a natural, uh, a prescribed natural fire. There are all kinds of options. And essentially all the things we're trying to do now were present uh, 40 to 50 years ago. What happens instead is that shortly, it was a revolution from the top Shortly thereafter, all kinds of counter forces come into play. And the polarization that has become so dominant in American life and society uh, sets in. Even the weather, the polar, begins really wet, ends really dry. Uh, politics transfer from civilian to military, from government to private, and so forth. All of these things mean that essentially the progress stalls. The revolution wasn't, wasn't reversed but we had a lost decade and a little more. In the meantime, what we do see is a recolonization of rural lands and that allows urban or we might call exurban fire to return. And for me, this is like having polio come back. We fix this problem. We know how to keep cities from burning. We stop that. What, what's happening? Something that got misdefined, and I can, uh, I can talk about it later if you wish, but in a sense, we're, we're in a, a decade, 12 years of counter revolution. It ends with two extreme events at the two extremes of the landscape. We're, we're losing the middle landscape as well. So Yellowstone, 40% or so burns in 1988, and then Oakland uh, in 1991, uh, a wooey on a really big scale. Uh, again, as so often, you'll see that despite the utter incineration of the houses, uh, the green area uh, survived. So something is, something is fundamentally wrong in how we're organizing these towns. Uh, but I would point out that both of these are informed uh, by a fossil fuel civilization, uh, the effort to eliminate fire, in one case, uh, the other two, um, how we would design our cities and so forth, uh, ignoring 
the possibility of flame returning. Okay, uh, new administrations, new events, uh, revolution restarts, uh, mid 90s, particularly after uh, South Canyon, 1994, our first billion dollar suppression era, um, the fatalities uh, at South Canyon, 1995, we have a common federal fire policy bringing together all the different agency stuff. Um, Interior Secretary Babbitt declares we're in a national fire crisis. And then in 2000, we have two breakdowns. So fire, 90 years after the big blow up, fire is running uh, amok in the Northern Rockies and not much we can do to stop it. At the same time, the National Park Service sets a prescribed fire uh, to reduce fuels. Uh, at uh, Bandelier National Monument, it blows up, becomes the Cerro Grande wildfire, burns into Los Alamos, and uh, resulted in a, a $600 million bill. Well, it seems that we uh, can't light fires and we can't fight them. And uh, that leads to a national fire plan in 2000, which put a lot of money, uh, maybe too much money too quickly into fire. Uh, to try to get ahead of the problem, but we continue to fall further behind. So we still have fires, uh, mega fires, uh, the term is coined after the 2002 season. Uh, now we're into giga fires, uh, more communities burn and more firefighters die. So we have, I would argue a roughly 50 year period that spans the revolution and suggests that maybe now we're into a, a new a new era. Nothing magical about 50 years, but we spent 50 years trying to take out all fires. We've now spent 50 years trying to put good fire back in with mixed results. And now I think we're, I think most people on the ground admit that we're too late uh, to get ahead of it, but we can certainly uh, moderate what's coming at us and learn to ride the tiger. So, Maybe the new policy guidelines in 2009, plus some other uh, legislation uh, promulgated then, change of administration, uh, sort of set us on a new course. The National Cohesive Strategy is a very odd creature, uh, doesn't have any money, doesn't have any uh, political clout, but it's an effort. It recognizes, I think, that the problem is not simply uh, in getting a national cohesive strategy, not simply getting policy right, it's getting the politics right. We need really a kind of fire constitution who's going to decide who does what, who pays for what, who has rights, who has responsibilities. How does that all play? How do we put a coherent uh, uh, enterprise together, not just react to ever growing threats? So I think we're left with a kind of pluralism Lots of agencies, lots of policies, lots of strategies, lots of practices. Um, a large civil society, coalition of prescribed fire councils, uh, spans most of the country, even going into Canada. The Nature Conservancy now burns as much per year as the National Park Service. And suppression isn't going to be left out. They actually have their association as well and larger, so we now have a lobby for suppression as well as it's. So this is not just a policy issue, it's really a social and political issue, which will ultimately be a cultural one. Suppression now means many things. It can be a whole range of things now. And prescribed burning can mean lots of things. It can be ecological burning, it can be pile burning, it can be broadcast burning for fuel reduction, it can be cultural burning, it can be agricultural burning in various forms all kinds of things. There's no one model now. It's all over the place. So that's good, but we also need to be able to pull things together. And we're left mostly now, it seems to me, with a game everywhere of rock, scissors, paper, which in a particular place is going to come out on top. So let me return, come to an ending here by going back to this very interesting Courier and Ives print across the continent. And uh, one of the things that stands out here is that there are two, the, the train divides two worlds. One is burning and uh, there are bison in the background fleeing it and the other is not burning. And in a sense, creating two realms of combustion 
And that is, that is how this is going to play out for a while. So if we think about the longer history of fire, we have a long period of earth history, most of it, um, where lightning uh, interacted in patches, uh, in, in sort of lumpy in space and time. People come along, they change the fuels, they change the ignition, uh, they create whole new patches uh, and pulses for fire and expand the domain of fire and, and the regimes of fire. And then you can say, I'm no graphic artist. Third fire comes in. This is uh, taking stuff, these lithic landscapes, and I'm trying to get a third dimension here, taking them out of the geologic past, burning them in the present with all kinds of interactions we don't really understand, we're just starting to realize, and then leaving the effluent for the geologic future. And we see the world more and more in one or the other state, either continuing to burn living landscapes openly or having gone to a kind of third fire. Now, the European model is a little compromised. There's a lot of hydro, France is mostly uh, nuclear, but these are still the results of really fossil fuel civilizations. And what gets lost in this is the middle ground. And that's what's so hard to restore. And should, shouldn't it strike us as odd that megafires are a pathology of the developed world? Here's another extreme example. One country that has made the transition are actually two, look at China and South Korea, North Korea, the dark side conspicuous by the absence of of light at night. But if you look at the MODIS satellites, where are all the burn spots? Well, the burning is almost completely contained within the political entity uh, called North Korea. Why that boundary should stop is on either side uh, is an interesting question. And it's basically, I think, because of this transition. And we can see two visions of the world and fire in that world. Uh, in this scene, uh, here we have a Biosphere 2, completely self-contained world, completely engineered, everything recycled, uh, a model, uh, something that could be plunked down in Mars uh, in principle. Uh, no place for fire, zero. Partly because of scale, and partly because it was never designed in. Uh, in the background, the Santa Catalina Mountains in sort of full-throated wildfire, a place that will burn and needs to burn. And how do these two line up? Well, one, we kind of accept it in wilderness. Okay, it belongs there, that's fine. But we don't want it in our towns. And again, we don't seem to have a middle that's showing us as active agents active fire creatures using fire to make a more habitable place. Well, fire has now, mega fire has now joined our forlorn polar bear as an emblem of climate change uh, and of the Anthropocene generally. I would argue that it's really an emblem of this larger third nature of a fossil fuel civilization uh, of which climate change is one part, but almost all the land use that contributes so much to our fire problems uh, go back as well to this transition um, to uh, fossil fuels, um, even filling up the place with plastics and petrochemicals and the rest of it and so forth. Fire exclusion would not even be imaginable in wildlands uh, without it. And we're seeing more now where these worlds are beginning to collide. And I like uh, power lines are a great illustration of this, carrying power from one realm, uh, intersecting with the other realm, uh, with often a lethal uh, results. And we can expect lots of uh, novel uh, ecosystems as this process continues. And in this case, we are talking about a global change where climate change is now acting as a performance enhancer. And I'm going to be a little sideways here and suggest that climate history is now a sub-narrative of fire history. 
that it is the human manipulation of fire uh, that is behind it in all of various ways. And many people concerned about the future uh, look with alarm that we have what they believe is no narrative by which to connect to the past and no analog, a no, an no analogy future, no analog by which to understand that future. And I, I suggest something uh, different. I suggest we have a great narrative and I've just been trying to give it to you now. It's a story of humanity and fire. And I think we have an apt analogy that we are entering, have been in and are now rapidly maturing a pyrocene. That is a fire age. And let me suggest that by comparing it to the Pleistocene, uh, the serial ice ages, which were full of ice informed landscapes, but lots and lots of periglacial landscapes, uh, outwashed plains, <coughs> pluvial lakes, permafrost, all this other stuff, uh, deeply influential everywhere, drop in sea level, mass extinctions, and the erectanes here, but the hominids, a genus that began manipulating fire. And uh, here we are doing what uh, hominids have done, bringing fuel to the fire. Well, as we get into a pyrocene, it's being shaped by anthropogenic fire in all its forms. And we see fire informed biotas or fire branded landscapes. Uh, we're driving off the ice everywhere. We have what you might call peripheral landscapes or peripyric landscapes uh, shaping things. Uh, uh, maybe these uh, monstrous um, smoke palls are the equivalent of outwash plains. We have a rise in sea level. We have mass extinctions underway. And we have our hominids, again, grappling with fire. But this time, this is from the uh, Fort McMurray fire in Alberta, fleeing from the fires in the sense of their own construction. Fort McMurray was a city created to mine tar sands, a fossil fuel, now using fossil fuels to flee the fires that are overtaking that city coming out of the living landscapes in the bush. So our whole relationship with fire has changed. We went from a fire uh, crisis to a fire epoch. And I, I recently, last year, I, I had a chance to uh, join a group in Yosemite looking at a 50 year program to restore fire in the Illouette Valley. And I was struck by Yosemite as Pyrocene Park. Here is a place famous for its glaciation, uh, a relic, a, a vivid emblem of the Ice Age. But now almost all of the major issues facing the park are fire related, whether they come from climate change or large fires or problems restoring fire. And uh, right now, it, it looks like we've lost estimated 15 to 20 percent of our mature sequoia groves, really, in the last uh, couple of years to large fires. So if you want a cameo of that larger story, there it is. Well, there's an old sense uh, of being caught between two fires and the old prophet, Old Testament prophet Ezekiel put it nicely. They shall go out from one fire and another fire shall devour them. Um, I have that on my wall. Remind me that fire doesn't have an end point. It's always changing. We're always having uh, to pass between it. But now it's not two fires, it's three. It's a three body problem for which there may be no exact solution and will require us to be innovative and prudent and bold and humble all at the same time if we are going uh, to get through it. So with that, uh, let me end and uh, open for questions. Hi, thank you so much. Um, we, we really appreciate it. It's such a, um, a new perspective to bring to the series. Um, we, we have a, a lot of questions and um, there are two questions um, that are related. And so I'll, I'll use one of them, but um, um, forests and prairies sequester carbon and fires release massive amounts of carbon. So how in the face of climate chaos can there still be good fires? Um, well, 
there are, there are several answers to that. One is that uh, the the traditional answer to that is that it's recapture. It's released from living landscapes and living landscapes, then restore it. And this is pretty easy where you've got grasslands. Where you've got forests or more complicated um, settings that take longer to recapture it, the problem is that with climate change, they may not be getting it at the same level or in the same way. I don't think anybody knows. I think there's a great case to be made for burning uh, prairies, particularly uh, wet prairies, uh, tall grass prairies and the rest, because we're putting some fraction of, of mineralized carbon back in the soil. And in fact, there's a large, uh, a lot of interest in recent years on biochar. Uh, the, the value of carbon in the soil uh, and enhancing uh, productivity and so forth. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to eliminate a lot of these fires. Um, we're going to have to live with it. Uh, what we can do is uh, uh, ensure we can we can protect some by by thinning, burning, uh, taking various mitigation measures, um, and others we can help guide what comes back for various biological purposes. Uh, how much carbon can be stored in that? I'm not sure. Uh, we're releasing a whole lot more buried carbon than can be captured otherwise. But that's also a distraction in some ways uh, because the real problem is the fossil fuel combustion. And if that begins releasing the carbon stored in permafrost and the rest, well, the game may be over at some point. So we're, we're arguing about what we can see these fires, which do threaten people. Let's be clear about that. Um, and the way to solve that is to protect communities. Um, and there are lots of ways to do that. Um, but that also um, distracts. Uh, you know, it's a magician. We're, we're, we're concerned about all this. All these flames are mesmerizing. They're very graphic. They're very visceral. Yeah, and they are a problem in certain places. Uh, but the real problem we're not seeing, that's going on while we're paying attention to this. We've got this other stuff, which is the real, which is the really fundamental problem. And we, we can't be distracted. So, I mean, people ask me, what should we do with this? Well, we've got to protect our communities. We know how to do that. And if we decided to, we could do it in a handful of years, really. And we've got to get our landscapes in better shape, both for ecological enhancement as well as protection. Um, and that could take a few decades, but we, we can do that. And at the same time, we have to be taming our climate change. We have got to get a handle on releasing all this combustion. I mean, we, these power plants are the equivalent of factory farms for fire. And like other factory farms, uh, they produce a lot of waste that can't be absorbed. And they're very efficient, but somebody who's picking up after them, um, society is. And so that's really, that's really where we need to put our, our energy. And I'm not saying we have to do one, then the other. I think we need to do them all at the same time. And part of the good news here is that a lot of the stuff with communities and landscapes, it's stuff we need to do anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, fire connect is a catalyst to get us to rebuild our creaky grid and do some better planning about how we live on the land and all kinds of other things. Anyway, I'm, yeah, I'm going. Well, that's my... um, we could we could use some catalysts right now for <laughs> for reimagining things. Oh, and that's that's one thing. Um, I'm I'm also trying to combine a couple questions here. Sure. Um, one of them um, is that um, in the Pyrocene, you write um, how we imagine fire will inform the relationship that we have with it, um, and so. What do you think is the best use of our imaginations when it comes to the future of fire? Um, or a, kind of another question, a different yeah. to get some other audience questions out here is also if you could wave a magic wand and complete um, one policy change and have unlimited funding, um, what would you do now? So, well, I don't think there's one thing. I, I would have one program with three parts. 
and I would go, they all have different scales. And just what I, I said, that would be it. Imagining, we, we have imagined fire as a, a physical process shaped by physical surroundings. And so if you think of it as a problem of physical chem, chemistry, then you respond to it with physical chemistry. You drop retardant, you drop water, you scrape away all kinds of combustibles, you go into bunk. I mean, you do, you treat it as though it were a tsunami or, or something. Um, and that model of fire is very useful for making tools. It's very useful for making steam engines and, and uh, blow torches and cars. Um, but we really haven't imagined fire as a biological creation. I mean, biology, life created the fuel, life created the oxygen. And in the form of the hominids, life is responsible for most of the ignitions, but we don't think of it as a biological creation. So we don't think as deeply as we might about biological solutions. And people are talking about reintroducing beavers. That's great. There are all kinds of things like that that can help that do multiple things as well as fire. But you have to think about it not just as fuel and flame, but as a, an all-purpose ecological catalyst. In the same way, we have to accept that we are the species monopolist over fire right now. We are the keystone species for fire on the planet. It is a part of our culture. We, we couldn't exist without fire. Fire can exist without us. We can't without fire. And we, we need to recapture this, that sense of obligation, not just the Promethean sense of unlimited power. I mean, there was a reason Prometheus was chained. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, there are there are a couple of questions around this theme, and maybe this will be the last question that we have time for. Um, um, this idea of um, so for those of us who live in fire prone landscapes like the West um, and who choose to live here to stay in these communities that are at risk because of how we've built them, who, you know, we are in these plumes of toxic smoke for months at a time sometimes. Um, what would you consider um, might be our or their relationship to continue, con continuing to live in these places? Um, how, how do we keep doing that given what we know? I'm not sure. Uh, if I had a, a simple solution, I would do it. I, I think, as I say, I, we have to do all of these things at one time. Uh, certainly, we need to recognize that, that smoke, long prolonged smoke is a problem. But we have created a landscape where fire, the, we can control all fires except the ones we really need to control which is the largest, most damaging, and they're so big, we can't do anything about them. And in fact, all of our efforts that burn out operations and backfires, all they're doing is making them larger. They're not stopping them. And we, we need to look to human life and uh, health. We can protect these communities. We know what's required to do that. Uh, for one thing, treat them like cities quit treating them like little houses in the big woods. They're not wildlands with houses. They are urban areas with funny landscaping. Yeah. And if you do that, it's pretty clear what you do to protect those communities. We've solved that problem before. At the same way, we need to think better how to provide protection for from smoke and prolonged smoke. But part of that then is getting the landscape in better order so we don't have these monstrous fires. And right now, the burning that needs to get done is being done by wildfires under the worst and least controllable conditions. Yeah. So, you know, this is something we can do. I mean, this is who we are. We are, we are the fire creature on this planet. <laughs> this is our, this is um, what we do that no other creature Yes. <laughs> I want to note to end on that this is something that we can do given, um, okay. yeah, um, I, thank you for that. Um, and thanks, thanks for, just, yeah, please, please. Just add one thing that, you know, we keep looking, well, what does science tell us? Science, science gives us a lot of data, but if we want meaning, we've got to look to the arts, we've got to look to stories, narratives, we've got to look to lots of it. We need everybody on the field in this. 
it isn't science who is going to tell us what we need to do. It will measure what's going on and tell us if our actions are, are helping or not. But these are cultural choices. These are value choices. And that's not a scientific question. So we need all the rest of the people part. So I, I congratulate you for your project and I'm honored to be able to, to be a part of it. Well, thank you. We have really been looking forward to, to hosting you. Um, and so thank you for, for joining us, um, even from your hotel room, <laughs> as you are uh, working on, on other um, speaking engagements as well. So we really appreciate you figuring out the technology tonight um, to be with us. And, and I wanna thank all of you um, who are joining us tonight um, from wherever you are. Uh, we, we hope you can join us next week as well. It's, it, it is exactly what you've just said, Steve Pine. This next week is uh, you know, bringing the arts into this conversation um, and, and th with theater and music. Um, and so we're really hoping that, um, that you can join us next week as well. If you haven't already got a copy, um, check it out um, among many other incredible books on fire that you have done over the years. Um, what an honor. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, good night, everyone. Thank you for joining okay. us as well.